Welcome to the DPS webin webinar um, presented by the Wellness Committee. It's called Gardening in Small Spaces. We have our host, Linda Stein, who is a master gardener with U of M Extension. And she is um, being joined by a couple other master gardeners behind the scenes that you may see or um, chip in with information. My name is Maria Tracy. I am with the DPS Wellness Committee and work for fiscal and admin with DPS. And with me today is my co-host, Tanya Booth. So Tanya, would you like to introduce yourself, say a few words? Hi, my name is Tanya Booth and I am the OTS, OTS representative on the DPS Wellness Committee. I have a few technical housekeeping notes before we introduce our presenter. Uh, a reminder that this webinar is hour long and will end at 1 p.m. with time for questions. Uh, this webinar will be recorded. The recording process takes 48 hours the uh, webinar recording and materials will be posted on the DPS Internet Health and Wellness Event Recordings page. You have all been muted for the webinar, but can ask questions utilizing the chat function, which should be on the right hand side of your screen. I will field any technical questions and the presenters will respond to any content related questions. When sending a question or comment in the chat box, please make sure to select all panelists. At the end of the webinar, we will post a link to the evaluation in the chat. Please take a moment to complete this short evaluation to help the Wellness Committee plan future webinars and events. We do want to hear from you. Now, Maria, to you to introduce our presenter. Thank you, Tanya. Uh, the presenter today, like I said, is Linda Stein. She's a master gardener of Dakota County, working with the University of Minnesota Extension. She's been gardening for over 40 years. Uh, she became a master gardener five years ago to learn the best ways to promote success in gardening and to share that knowledge and her love of gardening. She has lectured on various aspects of gardening and also enjoys learning new embroidery techniques, including making the perfect Minecraft mats, which I may order one, just saying. At this time, I'll turn it over to our presenter. Welcome, Linda. Hi, thank you, Marie. It's really nice to be with you today. Um, the topic today is gardening in small spaces. Uh, I will also have a, a few housekeeping items. First of all, um, we do encourage you to, to um, ask questions. Um, there, if you have a question, please write it in the chat box. Uh, my, co my fellow master gardener, Janelle, is going to be watching the chat box and we're going to try to respond to as many of those questions as possible after I've completed the presentation. So please list them. Janelle will try and answer some of them uh, within the chat box, box, excuse me, itself. And others I'll try to answer at the end. Okay, Oop, we are not there. Okay. Um, first of all, I just wanted to let you know, I, as, as Maria said, I'm a master gardener with the, within the University of Minnesota's extension program. We're all volunteers. Um, our mission is to promote healthy people, healthy communities, and a healthy planet by developing and communicating research-based horticultural knowledge and practices. All right. Um, I just wanted to show you, this is the priorities of the Master Gardener program. So all the programs, including this presentation, addresses at least one of these broad areas. Um, and today we're gonna be talking about things that address horticultural skills. And we'll talk about local food, things that you might grow in your own garden and address some of the issues of how pollinators impact that. So the topic for today is gardening in small spaces. And although it, you were talking about small spaces, it really can apply to almost anybody who's gardening. Certainly if you're gardening on your deck or patio, this applies to you. And if you have a small yard that you wanna beautify or grow vegetables, it applies to you. But in addition, even if you have a large yard, and you're like me, you look at how you define individual spaces within your yard and look at those in terms of a small garden within the context of your large uh, space. What we're gonna cover today is number one, how do you assess your space? Secondly, how do you choose the plants that you might wanna put in that space? 
the design options that you might consider to use that space more effectively. And finally, looking at other strategies that you might consider. So hopefully there'll be a bit of new information for you. Um, the first area I'm gonna talk about is looking at your space. And this kind of first part of the presentation doesn't specifically apply to small gardens. It would be for any garden, but I think it's important to review as we go through with the creation of whether it's an in-ground or a container-based garden. So first thing you really wanna do is look at what the soil is that you have. If you have an in-ground garden, um, I really encourage you to think about getting a soil test. The University of Minnesota does soil tests. You can, the information they provide is really, really useful. I don't get a spiff on this, but the, I really encourage you to think about and go to the University of Minnesota's site. They have a process for submitting those, mass, those soil tests. What is that soil test going to tell you? Well, the first thing they look at and talk about is your soil texture. Um, that talks about how much clay versus sand versus silt you have in your garden. Um, and soil texture affects the moisture and the retention of moisture in your soil. So as you, you know, it's pretty obvious when you have a clay soil, it holds together well. It's, it's harder to manipulate and um, your soil. Whereas the opposite, sandy soil is much easier to work. Um, the benefit of clay soil is that it holds moisture, but it doesn't drain well. On the opposite side, sandy soil is going to drain well, but you're, so you're going to have to water it more re regularly. Um, the amount of organic matter is another thing that a soil test will tell you. Organic matter are those little products, the uh, decomposed leaves and the decomposed plants and the manure that's been placed in your garden. Organic matter does a number of things to benefit your garden. Number one, it helps to hold nutrients in water. It also helps to um, prevent compression. You know, when you step on your soil, you really are creating some problems for plants. Um, it's closing up little air pockets that you might have that the root system of your plants need. Uh, the next thing that the soil test will tell you is the pH of your soil. If you think back to our chemistry in, way back when I had it in um, my high school science classes, it talks about either your alkalinity or the acidity of your soil. Um, the pH contributes to holding nutrients in the soil. It also, certain plants really like certain types of soil. The best example is uh, if you're trying to grow blueberries, I'm sure some of you have tried that. Um, blueberries really, really like acidic soil. And unless you have acid in your soil already or you add chemicals that would acidify your soil, you're not gonna have blueberries. Finally, um, the soil test will talk about your chemical composition. You know, if you go to the store and you look for fertilizer, you have those numbers. You know, it'll say that this fertilizer is 10, 10, 10 or 5, 0, 0. Those numbers um, relate to the percentage of certain nutrients in your soil. So the first number is the amount of nitrogen. The second is phosphorus and the third is potassium. And each of those um, chemicals do a specific thing to help your plants. Nitrogen contributes to the greening of your plants whereas phosphorus will help to enhance the root system. And it also contributes to the creation of the fruit and vegetables on the plant. Finally, um, your potassium is going to um, help with the disease resistance of your, of your plant and also contributes to root system. I wanna give you an example of how I know how important this is. When I first created my garden for vegetables a number of years ago, um, I went and bought a fertilizer in the, um, and it said in the fertilizer that it was the right selection to use in a vegetable garden. Put it in my vegetable garden. That year I had the most beautiful looking bean plants, but it, I had virtually no fruit on it. 
So looking at this chemical composition, what was happening is I had a lot of nitrogen in my soil, but I didn't have adequate phosphorus for the beans to um, grow. So at, within that um, soil test that you would get from the university, they would talk about what is the chemical composition of the soil and what type of fertilizer would be best to enhance your soil if you're growing vegetables versus fruit versus so um, possibly your grass. Also, when you're looking at soil, it's just as important to think about it if you're doing a container garden. Um, and in that case, make sure that you're buying potting soil. There really is a difference. Um, you look at the bags, you know, and they have them lined up and there's potting soil and container soil and there's raised bed garden soil. Well, garden soil specifically is much heavier and it, so it doesn't aerate and it doesn't hold nutrients like potting soil. So if you're planning on doing something in containers, make sure it's potting soil that you're selecting. The next thing you'd like to do um, if you're going to be creating a garden is looking at the sunlight. How much sunlight does you get? Because when you look at plants, either the seeds or plants that you might purchase, it's gonna say they require full sun or they require full, full shade. Well, full sun is anything over six hours of sunlight, whereas full shade is if it has less than four hours. In between, you have this thing called part sun or part shade, and that can um, relates to when the sun is occurring within your garden. So full sun, or part sun, excuse me, is the hot afternoon sun. It's much more intense than the morning. So if it says, a plant says that you want to have part shade, it's uh, a garden that's receiving just sunlight during the morning hours. So how do you determine what kind of sun you have? Well, duh, obviously you're gonna look at the, um, what, your sun, what sun is occurring in your garden. But I just want you to think about the fact, if you look at it at this time of year, it's gonna be very different in its impact on your garden potentially, because the sun's trajectory is gonna change. As you see in this diagram in the summer, Right now, you have the sun pretty high in the sky, but as we move toward the later summer and fall, you're going to have a sun much lower in the sky. And so the impact of things like trees or a fence or a wall is going to be more significant. So just keep that in mind. Just giving you some examples of um, some flowers uh, that would do really well in a full sun. Virtually all vegetables love sun and certainly a lot of perennials. But even if you have less sun, the sun in the morning, you can grow a lot of wonderful flowers. You're more limited in what vegetables could grow, um, but you can still grow virtually all herbs. And I'm going through this real quickly. Um, as Tanya said, my slides will be available at your website, the website of your wellness committee. So hopefully if you have to refer back, you'll have those available to you. Um, finally, if you have a shade a garden, you still have some wonderful um, options. I often get questions when we used to have our plant sale before this issue of COVID um, that uh, the, many of the questions were related to the ability to grow some pretty things in the shade. And like the center picture, if you're walking around your gardens nowadays in your neighborhood, you're probably seeing some of these beautiful bleeding hearts. The columbine are just gorgeous right now. So there are a lot of perennials that do well in shade. In addition, as shown in the bottom picture, coleus add wonderful color, as does impatience and several other annuals. Now getting into kind of thinking about what are the other things you need to do if you're particularly looking at a small garden. So um, what I'm gonna talk about is when you're, you look at a specific plant, for example, looking at tomatoes or looking at a specific type of flower, there are differences in different varieties of that plant. Um, for example, uh, impatience is generally a real go-to plant for a lot of people 
in a shade garden and they are wonderful and you can get all kinds of colors, but you want to make sure that you're getting the right variety or cultivar is the technical term of impatience because there are now a lot of sun patients. It's an impatience that's been de developed to survive in full sun. So thinking about your impatience in that way and make sure that you're buying the right variety of that. Here's another great example. Hydrangeas have become really popular um, in the last several years. Well, if you're looking at growing hydrangeas in a small garden, and you definitely can, you have to make sure that you're getting the right type of hydrangea. Um, on the left, you see, excuse me, <clears throat> hydrangeas that are climbing hydrangeas. So you could put these in a space that has an uh, opportunity to grow up a wall or grow up a fence and would do really well in a small garden. On the other side, on the right side of your screen is smooth hydrangeas, another variety that grows really well in shade and is a much smaller plant. So it would be wonderful addition to a small garden. What you'd want to avoid is the panicle hydrangeas, which are listed in the middle. As you see in my explanation, they could grow to eight to 15 feet tall. So definitely not conducive to a, a, veg, a small garden. Same holds true for vegetables. Um, there are a whole bunch of different varieties of each vegetable that you might want to think about if you're thinking about looking at a small garden. These are two seed plant seed um, packets that I purchased um, that are appropriate for either a small garden or a container garden. Uh, if you are looking at it, I have the words that kind of would appear either in on the plant description or on the seed package, they might say that it's a patio variety or a pixie variety, uh, tiny baby dwarf, or I've seen a lot that just say this plant is conducive to growing in a container. Okay, in addition to that, again, looking at not only the size of the plant, but the plant's habits are something you might wanna keep in mind if you're looking at growing it in a small garden. I think a bean plant is an exa ex excellent example of that. Um, there are bush beans and there are pole beans. Bush beans are, as this um, term says, they're bushy beans. They're gonna require a lot of horizontal space to grow where pole beans are gonna grow upward. So if you're looking at a small garden and you wanna grow beans, Think about pole beans and avoid those bush beans. Tomatoes, um, there are terms that you'd see if you're buying a tomato. Some say they're determinate tomatoes. Some say they're indeterminate tomatoes. So what does that mean? A determinate tomato is going to grow to a certain height and stop. So it might be, again, more appropriate to look at a determinate tomato if you're thinking about growing in a small garden or in a container. So in a tomatoes instance, you're going to look for determinant versus indeterminate. But in addition, there are varieties of tomatoes that are smaller. Examples, grape tomatoes, cherry tomatoes, and Roma tomatoes are going to be a smaller plant. And so selecting those would be appropriate if you're thinking about growing tomatoes in your limited garden. Already, so the next area I wanted to think about and talk about is um, what are some optional designs of gardens that would work well for a small space. Under this topic, I wanted to talk about raised beds, square foot gardening, vertical gardening, and some use of containers as a way of enhancing your space. What's a raised bed garden? Well, obviously, I, um, when you go into a lot of big box stores, or if you go into nurseries nowadays, you're going to see a lot of packets um, of um, kits that you can put together to create a raised bed. They've become really, really popular. And there's a reason for that. Um, raised beds have a number of significant advantages. One is they drain well, 
Well, that's because you're putting in, of course, quality soil from the beginning. So you're not worrying about the um, types of soil that you might have in the ground in your particular neighborhood. Um, there is an expanded growing season. And this is something I don't think we all think about, but because the raised bed is above ground, it allows uh, the soil to warm much more early in the spring and stay warm later into the fall. So you have a longer growing season. Um, easy maintenance. Well, because it's raised bed, if you have any trouble with your knees or you don't like bending over, this is gonna provide a wonderful opportunity for you to continue gardening in spite of that. The only caveat relative to that is to think about not avoiding when you're creating your own garden, um, a raised bed garden, don't use timber that's been treated with chemicals that could leach into the soil. Um, in terms of the height of the suggestion, uh, the, so the favorite height, if you want to grow a, man, a raised bed for purposes of maintenance, is to make it about waist height. And you also don't want to make it wider than your ability to reach to the middle of the garden. That may, it makes sense, but just to make sure that you're aware that um, you're not going to be stepping in there. So you need to make sure that you can reach the center of the garden to do the weeding and of course the harvesting when your vegetables are available. If you're thinking about growing a vegetable garden, I really encourage you to think about a square bed garden as one option. A square foot garden is, as the statement says, what you're going to be doing is dividing your garden into square foot sections and growing a vegetable in each of those sections. Um, you know, my dad used to have the most beautiful garden and I did too. And when I first started gardening, I had rows of tomatoes and then a row of beans and then a row of cucumbers and on and on. Well, each of those, in between each of those rows, you had a space of soil that wasn't being used, that you're using to walk around. So in the case of a square foot garden, you're using all that space. So obviously, if you have limited space, you're using it more effectively and using every bit of space for the growth of um, your vegetables instead of space for walking on. Um, in this uh, diagram, it shows, and you can find many sources online that talk about how many vegetables you could grow in each square foot unit. Um, for example, tomatoes and peppers are big plants, so generally you need a whole square foot to grow those. But if you look at carrots and much smaller plants, there, there is a belief that you can grow as many as 16 smaller plants in a square foot space. Um, so you can get a heck of a lot of um, vegetables in a very small space. Again, the limitation, which is appropriate for a small garden, is that you have to keep the width such that you can reach into the center of the um, garden. So generally, a square foot garden of this kind, you wouldn't want to make bigger than about four feet wide. Another thing you might want to think about is growing your garden up instead of vertically, horizontally, excuse me. Um, we talked about um, the bean plant, the pole plant, uh, pole beans where you're growing them up. Well, looking at other plants that you could use on a trellis is gonna provide opportunities for you to use your space um, on the garden surface more effectively with plants that are growing up your trellis. Um, if you look at the right-hand side where I show shelving, so in that footprint um, where you might've been able to grow plants, you're, you've kind of, multiplied by seven almost the amount of plants that you could grow in the same footprint. You also might want to consider a hanging pots or like the center picture, the upside down garden. 
And I have to say, I've never tried this, but I'm really tempted to. This is a tomato plant that's being grown upside down. So the, the tomato plant itself and the tomatoes are gonna grow under the pot instead of on top of the plant. What are some other considerations? So in addition to the design of the garden, there are other things that you could think about as you're looking at companion plant at, at um, using a small garden. One area is con to consider is companion planting. Um, what's companion planting? Well, companion planting takes into consideration plants that really like each other and would benefit each other. So, for example, some plants benefit other plants directly. Um, an example is beans. Beans are wonderful plants at providing nitrogen into your soil. So putting them right next to other vegetable plants can significantly benefit those other vegetable plants. Um, planting flowers near vegetables will attract pollinators potentially, which can then, of course, pollinate your vegetables and more effectively and get it providing you with a much larger crop. Uh, there are some plants that you might plant as a companion plant for the purposes of repelling pests. Um, I, I know people often talk about, and I've not been very successful at this, putting marigolds around your garden because they'll detract or put, because they, a lot of pests don't like the smell of the marigolds. Um, I, like I said, have not been real successful at that, but um, that, that is an example of using a, pet, a plant to repel pests. There's another concept of a trap or sacrificial plant. Um, these are plants that you um, grow specifically to attract and feed pests. A lot of farmers use this, for example. Um, a great example is um, if, if you have slugs in your garden, I've certainly had them and they do a number on my squash plants. Well, you know that um, it, that slugs like to chew on soft, um, soft stems and soft, softer um, leaves. So you might want to plant some plants on the edge of your garden that'll be attractive to those slugs. So they'll eat those plants and leave the one plant that you really, really like and are um, wanting to grow well um, away from those slugs. There are a bunch of different options that work well as a trap plant or a sacrificial plant for slugs. Examples are um, even coleus or basil um, will serve as a sacrificial or trap plant for you. Um, another option in terms of considering companion planting is to think about looking at tall plants. Tall plants, of course, look beautiful, but they also provide shade to shorter plants, and they can also provide and serve as a support for plants that require trellising. Now, I provided uh, the Wellness Committee with uh, a handout that lists various vegetables and lists in um, plants that are, they describe as companion plants and also ones that they talk about as allies ones that contribute something to the plant, and also enemies, which are other plants that you obviously don't want to plant close to each other. Um, companion planting has been around for a long time, and I do want to share this with you because I think it's a wonderful example of a companion planting that's been going on for years. This is, a, it's called the three sister planting. And it's a model that a lot of native tribes throughout the Americas have been using for generations. It relates to a, a, a folklore about three sisters. Uh, the oldest sister is tall and um, looks over after her sisters. The sister on the right is young and can only crawl around the ground while the middle sister is the nurturing sister she loves to take care of her other two sisters. Um, 
the one thing that they all have in common, of course, is that they love and care for each other. And the plants that they represent do the same. So the tall sister is represented by corn, which supports the bean vines that the middle sister has. And as I mentioned before, beans provide nutrients, the nitrogen specifically to the soil that be benefit her other two sisters. They also attract beneficial insects that are going to help the corn plant. And the younger sister is represented by squash, which benefits from the nitrogen that her middle sister provides. And she provides uh, these large leaves that squash plants have that provides shading for the soil to keep it cool. And it also um, provides coverage so that weeds are less likely to grow. Here's a picture of a three sister planting. The first one I ever saw was in the Dakota County Fairgrounds. This um, garden is about four feet by four feet. So you can see you have, a, it's a mound of soil. You have a, add a, quite a bit of corn, you have quite a bit of squash and quite a bit of beans that you're growing in that four foot by four foot garden plot. So three sister planting. The other thing you might wanna think about if you wanna use your small garden effectively is to think about succession planting and planning. This relates really to vegetables or to perennials. So if you're looking at vegetables, there are certain vegetables that mature quickly and early. Um, they don't like the hot weather in the um, summer. So they're vegetables that you might plant and you could have already planted even a month ago in our gardens and they will mature. And then the space that they have used, you could have um, plant some other plants. Um, example, you might have put lettuce in. Lettuce gets really bitter in the hot weather. So at that point, you might wanna pull out the lettuce and plant something else in its stead. Or you might still have your lettuce or some other early growing plants in your garden and the other plants will um, grow around it. Um, when you're thinking about perennials, um, you're gonna think about planting so that you have flowers blooming throughout the summer. So you're gonna look at plants that, uh, flowers that grow in this early spring, ones that are midsummer and ones that you'll see in the fall. The other thing about perennials, there are perennials that are called ephemerals. What we, they mean by ephemeral is the plants grow, they bloom and then they die back all the way. So you don't even have any stems or leaves. So you have this open space in your garden that you might want to fill with some annuals that would fill that sprayed space and add beauty and again allow you to use your garden more effectively. Here's some examples of plants that you could have grown earlier, you still could put in your garden now and they'll you'll have a nice crop within the next month. Um, so think about lettuce, snow peas, kale, broccoli, radishes. And here are some examples as you're looking at um, blooming perennials and the times that they bloom. So you might want to pick um, one or two plants from each of these groupings to put in your garden so that you'll have flowering throughout the season. Um, the other thing to think about is using containers. Um, that I'm thinking that you should use containers not only if you're gardening on your deck, which obviously you need a container, but even in your in-ground garden. Um, what is a container? Well, a container be, can be anything that holds soil and has a place for water to drain out. So you might use a pot that was explicitly made to grow um, plants in but you also might want to think about other things you have around your house. Here's someone use pails that they happen to have. You could use um, bins. So I, I don't know if you're like me, I have some empty bins that are sitting around and they work as beautifully as uh, a container. Um, 
here's an interesting way to use something you might have around your house that you aren't using anymore. The shoes work wonderfully to grow succulents because succulents only need very limited, they have very limited root systems. So they don't need a deep pot in order to grow where the purse is much deeper. So there, this individual was able to put some uh, other plants in that purse to add a really pretty appearance. I love this picture because I would never think of a pair of jeans as a container for plants, but obviously it can hold soil. And instead of having holes that it drains through the soil, um, any water that you put grow would, oh, I mean, excuse me, any water you put in the pots, in the, in the plants would be able to leach out through the um, plant, the pants, boy, plants and pants. It's easy, it's hard to say. But um, so this can work well also as a um, container for plants. When you're using plant on um, containers, again, just like we talked about in um, the garden itself, you want to think about what other plants can you put? Do you need to um, just put one plant or could you put multiple plants in a specific can in container? Um, when you're talking about a container and the aesthetics of a container, people often talk about um, putting in fillers thrillers and spillers. The thriller is the thing you put up in the middle. The spillers are those things around the edge that you might put in that spill around the edge of the pot. And then you put fillers in the middle to fill in the space between the thriller and the spiller. Um, so you can think about that, but also think about combining herbs, vegetables, and flowers. Remember what we talked about in relative to companion plants. Well, the concept of companion plants can also work when you're looking at a pot. So here in this container, they, the person did a wonderful job of having their thriller, a bunch of tomatoes in the middle. Around the tomatoes, they have a lot of herbs growing. Um, so those are the fillers. And um, if you look at the companion plant handout that I provided, a lot of herbs will uh, actually enhance the taste of the tomatoes. So the, these herbs are doing that. And around here, they, they look like they planted marigolds, which can um, repel certain pests, but you could also have put in flowers in this um, container that attracted pollinators to again benefit the tomato plant. Containers, as I said, don't necessarily just have to be on your uh, deck. They can also be part of your in-ground garden. Um, on the left is a picture of my, actually my grandson. We um, picked up a stock tank. You know, a stock tank is those things that actually uh, cattle use to feed and they work as a wonderful raised bed garden. And I was able to put this in a uh, space it's on a hillside, you can't really tell it from this. So we couldn't, probably couldn't have used it for a vegetable garden if I was just trying to garden in the ground. But using this um, raised bed stock tank allowed us to have a really beautiful vegetable garden last year. On the right uppers, um, using anything you have, in this case, they used an old wheelbarrow to create a garden. And I really encourage you to think about um, using pots in your in-ground garden. Um, in this example, you can see that they add some, uh, it adds to the aesthetics of the garden to have the um, plants at all different vertical levels, but it also provides additional space to add additional plants to your garden. So, when you're planning a garden in a small space, whether you're on a deck or in a yard, you can add a heck of a lot of beauty and you can grow an abundance of vegetables in a very small space. Um, if you have, I'm hoping that we'll be able to get to a lot of questions, but if we don't get to your questions or you think about stuff 
after we're done with this, here are some sources that you might want to look at. The University of Minnesota Extension Yard and Garden website is a great source for questions. Um, they have, uh, for example, I, I find very helpful an area that says, what's wrong with my plant? And you look at if you have a tomato plant and it's doing something, it'll walk you through questions that'll help you to identify what's happening to that plant. If you want to have a very specific question, there's an Ask a Master, master Gardener line. Um, you leave a, a message and a Master Gardener will get back to you. And finally, um, the, our Dakota County Master Gardeners have an online event that we're planning every Thursday evening from seven to eight o'clock. Uh, there's a link on the Dakota County Master Gardener website to this site. So I really encourage you to um, come online and hopefully our master gardeners in Dakota County can help answer your questions. I have provided, uh, and you'll have that if you go to your website, some additional references. So if you want more information on square foot gardening, succession gardening, raised bed gardenings, um, I have some good resources for you to use. And with that, I'm going to ask Janelle if there are questions in the chat box that she's going to answer for you, or if they're ones that I should answer. So take it away, Janelle. Hi. Um, yes, my name is Janelle, and I'm just facilitating here with Linda. Um, there's been a couple questions that have been asked. Um, and one is, does direct sunlight mean outside or does it mean, or can it be a window? Um, I think I know the answer to this question, but- uh, Go ahead yeah. and then maybe I can add. So um, when light is filtered through a window, um, you generally, you know, especially nowadays you can buy tinted windows in your home. Um, you, you generally get a little bit less light through, um, through the window. Um, so uh, when you're growing, for example, seedlings, um, uh, when you're first starting a vegetable garden and you want to try to do an in-house, you almost always have to have a grow light to add to the outside window. Um, so yes, the window does reduce the amount of light that gets into the, onto the plant. The only thing I'd add to that is um, you also want to think about what direction that um, window is facing. So um, a southern facing window is going to get more sunlight, for example, than a north facing or east or west facing window. So, yep, you're going to get direct sunlight, but it's going to be reduced and significantly reduced if it's a north, east or west window. Sure. Um, and then um, there was another question about how do I repel spiders? And uh, <laughs> spiders are, you know, there are a lot of people that have phobias over them, but they actually can be a beneficial plant to the garden. Um, you know, they, uh, some people use, uh, you know, plant rosemary or garlic or, you know, peppermint or cloves, um, either in a essential oil or in um, having those plants nearby can help um, that. I think, uh, uh, Robert had suggested using, um, you know, a spray bottle with 10 parts water and one part vinegar with some essential, you know, potentially those essential oils I just mentioned as also a way to, to eliminate spiders. Um, but again, they can be beneficial to the plant um, or to the garden in general. Anything else you want to add, Linda? No. Good. Okay. Well done. Um, and if you're unsure, uh, Robert mentioned this too, that if you're unsure about what insect is maybe biting your plants, um, you can always go um, onto the University of Minnesota Extension website and they have um, a particular website that says what's eating, you know, what, you know what's eating my plant. Um, and it can be very helpful in identifying um, bugs and what's wrong. So if it's a slug or whatever. Um, so those are always helpful. Um, another question was, do you know of anything that would help avoid wasps and hornets? 
Uh, Linda, do you want to take that one? I have an answer, but. Well, and as master gardeners, we don't really look, talk about that. It would just be looking at the impact on your garden. Um, so I, I certainly uh, hesitate to answer um, that. Janelle, I'm going to let you take that if you have some experience or knowledge that would be yeah. helpful. You know, I have wasps around my home on a frequent basis. They love the little um you know nooks and crannies uh, underneath the eaves um and you know the, the the only thing that you can really do is um you know make sure that uh well we we when we see them you know we try to spray the wasp stuff on it right away and then get that get rid of them um early on um and just and usually have to do it at night or in the evening, like six o'clock or after to try to, to avoid that. And you follow the directions on the can, um, you know, just making sure that the outside of your house and stuff is washed, you know, on a frequent basis, you know, to prevent them from starting um, a, a wasp nest. Um, you don't usually get a lot of, sometimes you can get ground wasps, um, but again, you normally deal with that if it's a problem, um, you know, and trying to control that at that point in time. There's, as far as preventing them, there's nothing that you can do to prevent them per se. Um, and, and could I just pop in really quick? This is Maria again. Um, we have a survey I just posted in the chat feature. While we're going through the questions, if some, if people could just fill out that quick survey about the webinar, that'd be great. Um, otherwise, we'll continue with the the questions we have about 10 minutes or so left um, in the presentation. So thank you, continue. Okay. Um, I'd like to say something about um, the wasps. Um, the University of Minnesota on their site has a new wasp page. So there are very beneficial wasps um, that don't even have stingers. So please go to that website and um, see um, the different pictures and they'll talk about uh, wasps and how to get rid of the bad ones and um, help the benef and help the ones that are beneficial. Great. Um, somebody else, is it possible to grow in uh, herbs indoors year round? Absolutely. Um, again, you'd want them in as much sunlight as you can, uh, sun facing or um, using grow lights, um, but you can grow herbs year round. Um, are there any types of containers to stay away from the planting? Um, all containers are good, uh, you know, that can be used. There's a variety even like, um, you know, I think it really depends on the purpose um, of what you're trying to, to achieve with your garden. If it, um, you have to consider weight, like like Linda might have mentioned, um, of the plant if it's plastic versus clay. Um, the only thing you ever want to stay away from is is just making sure that it's not, you know, a harmful substance, um, you know, that could harm the soil in any way, shape, or form. I'll just add a few things to that. I I really I um, didn't cover this significantly. I do in another presentation, um, but. Uh, when you're thinking about um, containers or pots for plants, here are a few thoughts to think about. Um, plastic is, the plastic pots you can buy are cheaper, um, but, and they hold water well. Whereas, you know, if you buy the terracotta, they're wonderful, they're much more expensive. Um, they, a lot, they don't, they, um, are better at draining water. Make sure that whatever you use as a container has that drainage hole I talked about. The other thing that I um, that you might want to think about is the color. Um, if you're looking at putting a pot outside, think about how um, dark colors attract heat. So a dark pot is going to attract heat. So if it's a plant that doesn't like the heat of the soil, um, it's going to be detrimental to the plant. Um, 
So you might want to, if you're putting a, a container in a very sunny spot in your yard, you might want to look for a plant, pot that's of a lighter color so that it won't dry out as readily and it won't get as hot for the plant's root system. Uh, another question was growing pumpkins. Um, how long does it take to, to grow them uh, from seed and what's the best, best time to, um, to grow pumpkins? Do you want to ask, answer that, Linda? Sure. Just happens that I started some pumpkin seeds. Um, if you are, it's a little late now to start pumpkin seeds. If you want to grow pumpkins now, I would really encourage you to buy plants from uh, appropriate nursery um, because pumpkins generally take a longer time um, to develop. Um, I haven't, and the other thing is that pumpkins, um, if you would have had to start inside, uh, I'll tell you a sad story. My um, daughter's neighborhood is doing a pumpkin growing contest. They grow pumpkins. There's a gentleman in the neighborhood who hands out seeds we planted those seeds inside um, and they were growing beautifully. But pumpkins are one of the plants that really like warm weather, don't like cold weather. And so we transplanted them actually into a larger pot because they were growing marvelously inside. I think we planted them, we might have planted them two months ago. Um, put them out about a week and a half ago thinking that, well, it's warm enough, it's in a pot, not in the ground, so they'd be okay. Well, they didn't survive. So pumpkins really desire warm temperatures. They need to be started inside if you're gonna be starting from seed. And um, if you're gonna be planting them now, buy a plant and put it outside. Uh, I, just like every other plant though, you might want to look at various varieties of pumpkins. There are the big pumpkins that are grown just to be jack-o'-lanterns, and there are those pumpkins that are grown for you to use for cooking, and those I think require less time, but I'd suggest you look on the, um, if you're big, picking up seeds or if you're look, picking up a plant, it will tell you how long it takes for that particular plant to bear fruit. Um, we just have a few, five more minutes left and there's a few more questions, but um, one was um, squirrels. Mm -hmm. What do you do about squirrels? <coughs> yeah, are you gonna answer that? <laughs> um, well, you know, with all creatures, you have to kind of live with them um, in nature and so, um, you know, you know, I, I don't know. I just live with them and I've got a wooded backyard and, um, I just learned to, you know, to, to live with them and, and they do like my bulbs, but I just plant extras, but other people might have a better answer than I do. Yeah. Uh, there's not much. I, I usually get a question about rabbits. I don't get as many questions about squirrels, but they certainly are a problem too. Um, the only thing that really works, I, people suggest sometimes spraying with a pepper solution that they don't like. So, you know, if you have um, water with pepper in it, that won't harm your plant, but squirrels dislike the taste of the pepper. Um, otherwise, um, just having to put some um, fencing around and potentially above your plant that will um, prevent those squirrels from getting to them the only solution. Okay. Um, and just want to plug the U of M. Um, if you Google the U of M soil testing that uh, you can do that for about $15. Um, and just you there's it on the website, it'll tell you how to do it. Um, we don't recommend just a standard, you know, soil test kits, um, really highly recommend the U of M testing. Um, I recently did it on three plots and um, it is interesting to, to learn about it. Um, uh, somebody had a very specific question about a Myers lemon plant. Um, the lemons start to grow, but then they fall off. Any ideas? Hmm. 
uh, you know, it, it, it's, it's hard to tell uh, if you, it, it could be that, again, it might be a soil issue. It could be um, that, you know, I, we talked about how various nutrients contribute to a strong, healthy plant. It may be that there isn't adequate phosphorus in your um, soil. It also could be that there are pests that are eating it. It would be hard to tell without looking. Um, what I'd suggest if you want to send a picture to, um, the unit, uh, to us, we could try and look and see if we can identify the problem. The other, again, I'm gonna refer you to the University of Minnesota's Yard and Garden website because you might be able to identify from that. They might have pictures of something similar that would help you identify what your problem is. And the last question was really about beetles eating your plants. Um, uh, again, I'll just say that the U of M has a, a great website that's very specific to, you know, if you've got raspberries and then the diseases and insects that, um, a tribute to those and it's just a wealth of information so I would refer you to to the U of M extension website and um, and really look there for very detailed questions because we only have one minute left <laughs> okay I I hope that we've provided you with some information that's useful and I just say go to it, um, enjoy the gardening. It's so exciting to be able to get out and start to enjoy our yards again.